according to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. On today's edition of Origins, millions of years, where did the idea come from? Hello my friends, welcome to Origins. I'm Don Chapman and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and use it to validate the truth of creation. I have with me a guest today who I think is going to be a great help to us in that regard. His name is Dr. Terry Mortensen. Dr. Terry, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a father of eight and a husband of one, and you're a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Today we're going to be talking about this whole issue of the age of the earth. And I hear all these people talking about millions of years. Uh, the G book of Genesis seems to be talking about less than 10,000 years. You've done some study in that. Tell us about your study and about maybe your conclusions even. Well, I, uh, I did a Ph.D. in the history of geology looking at the early 19th century and where this idea of millions of years came from. So uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this and didn't grow up believing the Bible on this subject, but have come to a firm conviction about that. In uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says this to the church there, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He says here, uh, Don, that we're involved in a warfare, and this war is, uh, is a war that makes the, the uh, war against terrorism or the Second World War look like a Sunday school picnic because it's a war of eternal significance. Yes, it is. And uh, Paul says here in this second verse that it's a war of ideas speculations and lofty ideas raised up against the knowledge of God. There's another verse in the book of Colossians. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So uh, he, he shows us that there's really two competing uh, ways of looking at life. The philosophies and, and traditions of men which he warns are deceptive as opposed to the teachings of Christ. So when we have Christ at the center of things, it opens the door then for a God who is behind it all. And without that, then we have man coming up with his own ideas of how we got here and what we're supposed to do, absent God and absent Christ. That, that's exactly right. And I think it's important for people to understand the history, where these ideas came from. You know, everybody in our culture today thinks it's billions of years, but people didn't always think that way. Well, you've studied this. We would really appreciate you helping us understand where this whole idea of millions of years came from. We have to go back to the early 19th century, late 18th century, and uh, there were a number of individuals, we only have time to look at a few, who were very influential in the development of this uh, idea of billions of years. One was a German mineralogist by the name of Abraham Werner, and he, uh, he looked at those layers of rocks like we see out in the Grand Canyon 
and imagined that or speculated that this was produced by a slowly receding global ocean over about a million years of time. Now he didn't pay any attention to the fossils in the rocks, but that idea of uh, millions of years involved in uh, laying down those rock layers stuck with his students. Very influential teacher uh, in the subject of geology. Another man living at the same time up in Scotland was a man by the name of James Hutton. He was trained in medicine, but he, uh, he took over the family farm and his, uh, did that for a while, but his real love was geology. And he proposed uh, a little different theory of the earth than Werner. He said that he, he observed his farmland was eroding into the rivers with wind and rain, and then those rivers would take the sediments down to the ocean and uh, deposit them there. And so he imagined that earth history was really cyclical. The continents were being eroded into the oceans, the oceans were being hardened and then raised up to become new continents which then would erode into the oceans and so he said he could see no evidence of a beginning for the creation of the earth. Uh, then there was George Cuvier. Now Hutton didn't pay any attention to the fossils either but Cuvier was a paleontologist who studies fossils and he proposed a theory that became known as catastrophism and he said that those rock layers were, were the result of regional or global floods, many over the course of millions of years. And um, so that's how he explained the rocks. And then there was another man uh, at that same time in England, William Smith, who was a drainage engineer and a surveyor. He was involved in building canals and road cuts and uh, tunnels for the distribution of the uh, raw materials and the finished products of the Industrial Revolution. And as he saw those rock layers, he became fascinated with the rocks and fossils. He became known as the father of English stratigraphy because he invented the method of using fossils to give relative dates to the rocks. Uh, one other person that was very influential in the millions of years was Charles Lyell. In contrast to Smith and, and uh, Cuvier, he uh, advocated a theory that became known as uniformitarianism. Big long word, the, the simple part of it is uniform. He said, no regional or global catastrophes in earth history. Everything happens at a uniform rate as we see it today. The same amount of erosion, the same amount of sedimentation. And his book, Principles of Geology, was very influential. Terry, it seems like these guys are all over the board. Uh, very diverse views. Obviously, they contradict each other. Uh, they can't all be true, right? That's, that's correct. And they, the key word here is they're speculating about the past that they never observed. Everybody's just sitting down. This isn't right. really science. This is just people imagining. Right. Uh, but they did have one thing in common, and that is they all rejected the biblical view of history and were advocating millions of years. Okay. So uh, we can represent these uh, ideas uh, just a quick summary here, because we went through the history really fast. Uh, Werner believed in a receding ocean producing the rock layers at, over a million years. Uh, Hutton was a uniformitarian, slow gradual processes and no evidence of a beginning. Uh, Cuvier was a catastrophist who believed in long ages to produce those uh, rock layers. Uh, Smith was also a catastrophist and invented the method of using fossils to date the rocks and then uh, the uniformitarian uh, champion, Lyell. We can represent their views by a little line graph uh, okay. to help people understand the difference here. So the catastrophists were saying that way in the past there was a beginning, most of them believed in a god of some kind, uh, but that over the course of millions of years there had been these catastrophic floods that uh, deposited those layers of sediment and it was many catastrophes to produce the rock layers like we see. The uh, uniformitarians, however, said no catastrophes in earth history, no seas on that line, and everything is happening just at the present rate of change all the way back through it's time. It's fascinating to me that they're looking at the same evidence and coming up with opposite conclusions. Right. Well, it depends on your starting assumptions. It sure does. During that uh, time period in the early 19th century, there were some men called the scriptural geologists who uh, wrote against these two ideas and they raised biblical and geological arguments against these interpretations. They held to the biblical or traditional view that, that people had believed for 18 centuries. Boy. There were others who responded to these views 
by saying, okay, uh, they're arguing about these, some of these details, but they have, have really proven that the earth is millions of years old, and so we have to fit that into the Bible somehow. Okay. So uh, we'll just look at a few of the key individuals that proposed how to do that. One was Thomas Chalmers, who was a Presbyterian minister and a naturalist, uh, or we would call him scientist today, and he started advocating the gap theory. Maybe many of your listeners would uh, recognize that. That view says you can take all those millions of years and put them between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis, and then, so they say, that solves the problem. The, the uh, Bible is harmonious. Others said, no, that's not a very good idea. Uh, Hugh Miller was a, a Scottish Presbyterian and a geologist, and uh, he advocated the gap theory for quite a while, but just before he died, he began to advocate the day-age view. Uh, he wasn't the first. He built on the ideas of another man about 20 years earlier. But uh, the day-age view says the days of creation are not literal days, like our 24-hour days, but they're symbolic of long periods of time. And so from about the middle of the 19th century then, the gap theory and the day-age were kind of competing views in the church. Then there was one other uh, influential idea, and that was uh, John Pye Smith, a congregational theologian. And he, in the uh, 1830s, began to advocate the local creation and local flood view. That is that Genesis 1 isn't talking about the creation of every, everything, but just the creation of things in the Mesopotamian Valley. And, and the same with the flood. It wasn't a flood that covered the whole planet. It was just a flood that covered modern-day Iraq and uh, is just described in exaggerated language. We need to understand that when scientists look at the world, they don't look at the world with a, a blank mind. No. They have certain assumptions uh, before they ever leave their office to go out into the world or before they ever go into the laboratory, they have certain ways of thinking, certain ideas that they uh, have about what they expect to find as they study the world. And so we need to look at what was going on at this uh, time. And there were two uh, religious or philosophical views about the world, and we call those world views, uh, that were developing at this time. In the late 17th and early 18th century, you had deism. And uh, deism is a view that says there is a God, He created the world, but He created it more simply than it is now. And then at the beginning, He uh, endowed that creation with the laws of nature so that it would operate the way He designed it. Much like uh, a watchmaker making the watch and then letting it run according to the way that He designed it. So in the deist view, um, God did not do miracles. He never did miracles because a miracle would be a violation of the laws of nature. So God in the deist view is distant. He's in the past. And uh, therefore, they did not accept the Bible as the inspired word of God. They didn't accept Jesus as the uh, son of God. And the miracles in the Bible were rejected. And this received a firm response from uh, Christian theologians so that about by the middle of the 18th century, open deists had really kind of vanished, but their ideas didn't vanish. They kind of went underground and resurfaced uh, in several ways. One way is in 19th, early 19th century science. The other view that was developing at that time was atheism. And of course, with the atheist, there is no God. It's just the universe. And uh, there have always been atheists, but in the, in the history of man, most people have believed in some kind of God. It was in the, in the 18th and 19th century, particularly in France, that atheism really began to, to take hold. And uh, it was actually the, the uh, impetus for the French Revolution. Uh, the Christian worldview is similar to the deistic view in that we believe that God is distinct from the creation so that if the universe disappeared, God would still exist and He is the author of it. But the Bible also teaches that God is intimately involved in His creation, upholding His creation by His power and from time to time, he works in unusual ways, which the Bible calls miracles. Those miracles are not a violation of the laws of nature because the laws of nature are not like our traffic laws that <laughs> God has to obey. They simply describe how God normally uh, operates in the, in the world. That's right. So, the Christ, so what we had here in the 18th and 19th century was a conflict between these religious views about the world. So if we're going to take a Christian lens now and look back at the history lesson you gave us, uh, what, where are those guys coming from when they're writing these perspectives? Okay, 
That's, that's a very important question. So let's look at, at some of those men, and we could look at some others who were influential here. But historians of science have been able to study the writings of these men, both their published and their private writings, and uh, we have a pretty good idea of what they believed. Werner was a deist. Uh, Hutton was a deist or an atheist. Uh, Cuvier was a deist or some kind of vague theist. In other words, uh, he believed in some kind of a God, but his writings are, are vague and you don't know what kind of God. Maybe it's just, you know, the man upstairs kind of thing. Uh, Smith, the same. His writings show that he, he wasn't a Christian. He was some kind of theist. And then Lyell was a deist or a Unitarian. And in terms of working out a history of the world, it doesn't really matter. It's basically the same approach. We if, need to uh, take a break, and we're going to come back and talk about the ramifications of that. Stick with us through this break, and when we come back, we're going to see what those ramifications are. So I'll see you in a minute. Hang in there with us. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Big headlines, the fine prints missing. Every time there's a supposed new human missing link fossil discovered, it's a featured news story all over the world. Hearing these claims, people begin to believe them. The problem is what they don't hear about. The full report later revealing the true facts that the fossils are not missing links at all. So naturally, people begin to believe man came from an ape-like ancestor. The truth is that no missing links have ever been found. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Terry Mortensen, is also the author of a new book entitled The Great Turning Point. You'll definitely want this book for your personal library. Book orders are being taken at 1-800-778-3390. That's 1-800-778-3390. Dr. Mortensen is also a speaker, researcher, and writer for Answers in Genesis. For more information, write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit them online at www.answersingenesis.org. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Origins. I'm here with Dr. Terry Mortensen, and we're talking about where the whole idea of the world being millions of years old came from. Terry, you've hit us with some uh, new stuff, some things that, new concepts to me. When you go back before Darwin and you start talking about the roots of all this, it's information that some of us aren't very familiar with. So I wonder if you would go back to our, our, uh, our summary there and, and just uh, elaborate a little bit more. And then you have a couple of powerful quotes that I think really show where this is all coming from. Would you share that with us? Yeah, well, Don, we're, we're trying to help people understand that when scientists do their work, they're not unbiased, objective pursuers of truth. They, they have a worldview. They have a way of looking at, at the world. They have certain assumptions about the world, about whether there's a God or an, isn't a God, and whether, uh, how God relates to his creation. And those are, not, those are not scientific ideas. Those are religious and philosophical ideas. It isn't just the Christian that brings a perspective or a worldview to the study. Everybody does. That's right. Okay. And the, the conflict between creation and evolution is not between science and religion, as the evolutionists often want to present it. It is a conflict between the religion of some scientists against the religion of other scientists. That's right. And uh, so we, we talked about the deists who uh, believed in a God but didn't see that God was active in his creation. He was distant in the past. And we talked about atheists. Of course, most people know what that is. But I want to read uh, a couple of quotes by two of the men who were influential in developing this idea of millions of years. One was uh, Charles Lyell, who was speaking at King's College in London in 1832. And he said this, I have always been strongly impressed with the weight of an observation of an excellent writer and skillful geologist who said that for the sake of revelation, that is for the sake of the Bible, as well as of science of truth in every form, the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if the scriptures were not in existence. <laughs> so he's saying we just throw the Bible out the window and as we do our geology. Now, let me illustrate how significant this statement is. Suppose that I was a teacher of early Roman, first century Roman history, and you were one of my students. And I said, Don, I want you to write a paper 
on some aspect of first century Rome, but here's the rules for your paper. You can study any of the artifacts, the, the artwork, the remaining coins, the sculptors, sculptures, the, the, any of the buildings that we still have pictures of, uh, and you can write your paper on the basis of that, but you are not to consult any Roman historian from the first century. <laughs> the ones who were there and left us a record of what happened, you can't talk to them. Right. So how accurate would your paper be? We leave the we aren't leaving room for science, we're leaving room for imagination. That's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And so what Lyle is, is advocating here is the removal of the Bible, which claims to be the eyewitness testimony of the Creator Himself. That's right. Now let's look at one other quote uh, from James Hutton, who was the one who, he, he actually died the year Lyle was born, and Lyle built on Hutton's ideas. He said, the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. So notice what he says. As we go out to look at the rocks, we can only use present processes, what we see happening now, to explain what happened in the past. And secondly, he says, we can only use natural processes. Well, what he's just for, uh, is said is basically an atheistic view That's right. of science. The assumption has to be made that there's no God and that he can't work in supernatural ways. Right. Or even in, in, in natural uh, disasters that God couldn't work. It ha uh, that's just silly. Right. It, we're and ruling out the, the reality and truth. Right. Okay. And so what we need to see is that the philosophy or the religion that controls the scientific establishment all over the world today is the philosophy that philosophers call naturalism or uh, scientific materialism as it was called in the communist world. And uh, there are two main assumptions of this philosophy or religion. The first assumption is that nature or matter is all that exists. There is no God. It's just whatever we see physically is all there is. And the second assumption is that everything can and indeed must be explained by three things, time, chance, and the laws of nature working on matter. So you go out and you look at the rock formations and you say, okay, we got to explain this by time and chance and the laws of nature because there is no God who has acted in history to have anything to do with what we're looking at in the rocks and the fossils. It, it just eliminates the possibility of the truth. Go ahead and uh, wrap okay. this up for we us, can, Dr. We can look at it with this uh, diagram. Uh, really, we need to understand that all scientists, whether they're creationists or evolutionists, they all have the same facts. They have the same stars, the same planets, the same earth, the same rock layers, the same fossils, the same living creatures. Right. But what your starting assumptions are will affect what you see and how you interpret what you see. And so, uh, if you start with the philosophy of naturalism, that nature is all there is, there is no God, you will try to explain all of that by time and chance and the laws of nature. And so, you come up with an evolutionary view of, uh, of, of, of billions of years here. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if you start with the Bible, okay, and you look at what the Bible says about events in the past that are significant to understanding the world we live in, such as creation in six days, a global flood, and you use those assumptions to go out and look at the world, you'll find that the world, the evidence actually confirms what the Bible says. And the, the wrong assumptions will lead you to be blind to facts out there in nature that, that show the Bible is true. You have a verse for us. Uh, yeah, I want to close with a verse from Isaiah 66 where God is talking about His creative work and He said, My hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. You know, the Bible says, you just read it's a beautiful verse that says that God said that by His hand all these things were made. And we don't apologize for the fact that that's our assumption and that's where we begin. But we need to understand that the naturalist, that the evolutionist on the other side also has assumptions. He's going to say there is no God and we're going to make that assumption from the beginning. And it is your assumptions that's the lenses through which we look at the evidence that always affects the conclusion. Right. Friends, I want to say to you that I believe that I believe with all my heart that it's God who has made us and uh, it is fair and true to assume from looking at all that He has made 
that in fact God is the best assumption that one can make. I'd love to hear what you think. Why don't you write to us at Origin CTV Wall PA 15148 and tell me what you think or email us there at the address on the screen. You know, it's God's view that He made you and that ought to be your worldview too. Join me next time as we look further into the evidence of science to affirm the truth of creation. God bless you till then. this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 447 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program number 447, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.